Hi everyone, I'm Martin and welcome to my astrophotography tutorial. Today I'm going to be talking about calibration frames and how you can create them and use them to improve your astrophotography results. I hope you find it useful. The topics I'm going to cover in this tutorial are I'm going to start off with light frames and why we need to apply calibration to improve our pictures. I'm going to explain the different types of calibration frames, explain what each one is used for and how to create them. And then I'm going to show along the way some examples of the effects of the calibration. And then at the end, I'm going to give a demonstration of using Deep Sky Stacker, which is a very popular free stacking program, to stack your uh, images, including uh, the calibration frames, so that you can take advantage of calibration. So let's begin with we're going to cover the different types of frames with light frames. Uh, light frames are your actual photos of the object. Uh, and uh, those photos uh, you're probably by now taking on a tracking mount, tracking the sky, so you've probably sussed out how to set up your telescope and camera uh, and, uh, and you're tracking the sky and taking multiple shots and you're looking to stack those, maybe you've already stacked uh, images in, in Deep Sky Stacker or something similar and now want to take that next step of improving those pictures uh, by introducing calibration. The example uh, on this screen here is of, obviously the Great Orion Nebula and uh, you can immediately see one thing about it is that it gets dark towards the corners and that's a vignetting and that's one of the artifacts that we're looking to try to remove with the calibration. So the first type of, uh, of calibration frame I'm going to explain is a dark frame. And the dark frame is used to remove the non-random part of the uh, of the sensor-generated uh, artifacts. So, if you think of hot pixels, for example, you may have noticed in your images some pixels coming out red or white if it's a monochrome camera, or green or blue uh, pixels that are are clearly not functioning quite correctly, and uh, and those are spoiling your shots. And the dark frames will address that. There are also other effects such as banding on the sensor. This image here is a, a dark frame uh, with the brightness turned up from my uh, DSLR and you can see it's got a dark band across the sensor. don't see that on normal daytime shots but uh, when you shoot a dark frame you can see it. Uh, so dark frames are created uh, uh, in the same session as your light frames and actual shots and the reason for that is that your sensor needs to be at the same temperature uh, as when you took your shots. So if you get the opportunity to take your dark frames because some clouds have blown over, that can be an efficient way of using your time, get you to bed a bit earlier. Uh, and uh, But otherwise, uh, you could do your dark frames, for example, at the end of a session. Uh, you need your lens cap on, uh, dark filter selected if you're using filters, or maybe both, I, I do both. Uh, and uh, you need to use the same exposure time, uh, or duration as, uh, as the light frames and the same gain or ISO if you're using a, a DSLR uh, and because the random part uh, is we're not trying to remove the random part we're trying to remove the non-random part we're going to need to average or uh, have enough frames to average out the random part so at least 10 dark frames uh, are required and uh, to be honest the more the better but it's a diminishing return once you get to about 20 it's pointless 10 is probably enough, you might want to go a little further, depends uh, on your preference. So that's dark frames. Uh, and here's an example of dark frames. So this is from a monochrome astro camera, uh, and uh, it's a light frame with no calibration applied. And I've just zoomed in on a small portion around one star, so we can see right down to pixel level what's going on. Uh, this is with no calibration, and then I apply just the darks, no other type of calibration, just darks. And you can see uh, a number of artifacts, in particular here and here, up here, various places around that image, uh, where the artifact is completely disappearing, whereas otherwise it might have looked a bit like a star. Um, so, so you can hopefully see the benefit of applying darks. So the next type of calibration frame is the flat frame. And flat frames are for uh, trying to remove the effect of vignetting. Now, vignetting is an optical effect, so it's to do with uh, the uh, characteristics of your optical train, so whether it's a camera lens or a telescope you're using, 
uh, and also the size of your sensor. The more you try and squeeze a wider field of view with a bigger sensor uh, out of your telescope, the more vignetting uh, you will see. Uh, and uh, so, so it's obviously nice to get rid of this effect because it's not what's happening in the sky. Uh, now to, to generate a flat frame, we need a uniformly illuminated sensor. So a couple of different ways of achieving that. Uh, I use a fairly cheap uh, USB uh, LED uh, light box type uh, object, uh, which I bought uh, online. I put my telescope in a vertical orientation and place the, uh, this box on top of the telescope, switch it on actually on its dimmest setting. Uh, but you can also stretch, for example, a white t-shirt over your telescope or lens aperture, secure it with an elastic band and point it at a nice even area of bright sky, for example. It's important to use the same focal length and the same focus as your light frames to best replicate the, the vignetting. If you've got a DSLR, put it in aperture priority, so AV mode, and set your aperture the uh, same as you use for your light frames, which will almost certainly be the widest aperture. Uh, and if you have exposure compensation, make sure that's set to zero. Again, we're going to want to average, uh, so we're going to want multiple flat frames, maybe shoot 15 or 20. You don't need to shoot these at the same in the same session as your light frames. You can do this as a completely separate exercise in the middle of a day, um, broad daylight, uh, uh, it's not a problem. And uh, you, you want to average them out to get an average kind of effect. Now your, your flat frames are going to include those systematic artifacts such as hot pixels, etc. Uh, and uh, we want to make sure the flat frames are as pure as possible so they don't introduce artifacts. They're trying to just remove vignetting, not introduce other effects. So that's the reason why we have the next type, which is a dark flat. Now, a dark flat is to take those systematic features from the sensor out of your flats. Uh, and uh, that's generated exactly the same way as for generating a, a flat except that you cover up the edge of your telescope, put your lens cap on, to select your dark filter or both, uh, but keep everything else the same. So when you set up to generate your flats, generate your flats, then flats, and then put the cover on and to generate your dark flats. Again, 15 to 20 of those. For your flats and your dark flats, uh, I would recommend using the same, uh, certainly your, your flats, use, uh, uh, use the same setup but use diff uh, repeat it for different filters. So you want to generate a set of files for each of your filters if you use filters. And you may find you need to change the exposure time. And it's really important with flats uh, that you get the exposure time right so that you're not saturating the image and you're not too dark. You want a mid-range sort of grayish looking uh, image uh, out of the box. You don't want to be having to stretch it to see to see that it's gray. So some, some programs offer you the ability to see uh, how bright uh, your image is with respect to the dynamic range that's available. But make sure you've got a good exposure. And if you're using filters, you'll find you need to change the exposure quite a bit on uh, depending on which filter is there. So here's an example of the effect of applying flats. Uh, this is a stacked uh, DSLR image of the Great Orion Nebula. You can tell it's been through a deep sky stacker or, or a stacking program because of the artifacts around the edges and where it's lined up with different images. But no, no calibration has been applied here. And you can see it's got a significant vignetting around the corners. You can see it's got a bit of a dark band uh, along the bottom as well. So if we now uh, repeat that but include the flat, this is the effect. So you'll see first of all that it's, it's corrected and actually to some extent this example has overcorrected. So my flat is not perfect here. It's attempting to take out the vignetting. It's gone a little bit over the top. It's getting a bit too bright in the corners, in fact. And I also noticed that it fails to fix the dark band along the bottom edge of my image. So there's some imperfections in my flat here, but it's just an example. So the best, the better the job you do of creating your flats, the more accurately you do it compared to your normal setup, the more effective it will be uh, at removing these gradients that you don't want. The final type of calibration frame is the offset or bias frame and this is used to remove the uh, readout signal from your sensor chip uh, from, from when it let, read the light frames can actually generate a signal uh, just by reading the chip. Uh, so it's probably the least vital of all of your calibrations. 
Um, as far as I'm aware, its effect is fairly small. But uh, I include them anyway, and uh, you take them with the lens cap on, or dark filter, or both. The fastest shutter speed you have, the same ISO and gain as you use for your light frames. The temperature doesn't really matter, and you don't need to repeat it for different filters. Again, shoot 15 to 20 of them, and uh, that will give you a, a decent set of offset bias frames. So what I'm going to do now is to uh, do, give you a quick uh, on-screen demonstration of using Deep Sky Stacker to stack a set of images uh, using uh, calibration. So uh, for those of you who have used Deep Sky Stacker before, I apologise if I'm giving too much detail. For those of you who have not, I'll probably be more interested. Uh, so we start off by opening our picture files. So the menu on the left hand side at the top there, open picture files. And uh, I've got a set of uh, data here. Uh, it's actually narrowband data in three uh, different colours. Uh, but I'm just going to take uh, the hydrogen alpha. So I'm going to do a monochrome uh, exercise here just with HA. Okay, so I've now loaded my light frames in. And you'll see it says a type light. So I'm now going to load the dark files in. So click on dark files and browse to our dark files and load them in. Now I've got the number of darks. Uh, next we want uh, flat files. There we go. And I've got flats that are specifically for the hydrogen alpha filter. Those. And now we want the dark flats. And I've done my dark, I've repeated my dark flat screen filter, probably pointless, but I did. And the offset bias files last of all. So, those, dropping them in. so now I've got my complete list of all of my, uh, my light frames and my calibration frames. And actually a useful little uh, tip just along here, it tells you how many you've got, actually if you do check all tells you how many you've got of each. So I've got 12 light frames, 5 dark frames, 17 flat frames, 20 dark flats and 20 offset and biases. Now before we do any stacking I'm just going to uncheck all. I'm just going to select each of my light frames in turn. I'm just going to drag this bar down here so I can see the image more clearly. And just preview my images. So I'm going to brighten them up. The top right corner there's a, a levels adjuster. I'm just going to bring down the, the grey level and bring up the dark black level a little bit. That will start to. Oops, too far. That's what we do. So now I can have a nice look at them. Just make sure there aren't any nasty streaks from satellites going across, or, or or obvious poor focus or anything like that. So just clicking through each of my images in turn, just making sure there's not anything nasty going on in my data. One, three more. Okay, so they all look fine. So I'm now going to hit check all, so everything is selected, and then register checked pictures. Now um, I have registered these before, so I'm going to make sure I tick that box so it registers them again. I want it to automatically detect hot pixels and to stack after registering. So uh, it's nice, it's a green here showing me it's happy, it's got all the different files that it needs. So we click OK and OK again and now it's uh, adding up the dark frames, create an average dark frame, saving that as a master dark, adding up my dark flats, so 20, just running through. fifteen of twenty. That's finished with the dark flats. Now it's adding the flat frames together. There's 17 of those to do. Top bar shows you the progress through the whole set, and the bottom bar just the progress on the current frame that it's working on. So it's done uh, 10 of 17. As you see, it prepares all the calibration data first and saves 
masters of each one. Now it's registering the images, so it's it's finding out what uh, delta horizontal and vertical shift and what rotation angle to apply to make all of my 12 light frames align so that it can stack them, and that's called registering. It's now done that, and it's just computing stacking information, so it's going to start stacking, and now it's stacking my images. But as it stacks them, it's also applying the calibration. So once you've got your calibration data and included it in your list of files, selected files, there's really a very simple process to include them in your stacking process. So it's now finished. And there's the final product. Now at this point I normally just save to file. There's a save picture to file and then you type in a file name. We'll call this Cygnus Wall with Cal. Brackets HA. And you'll notice there's some options at the bottom. I always leave it on the default, which is to embed adjustment, adjustments in the saved image, but do not apply them. If uh, you apply uh, any adjustments you've made to the saved image, you can cause trouble later uh, in post-processing when you convert from a 32-bit to a 16-bit image. Uh, but these adjustments that it's talking about, um, I'll show you in just a second. So just hit save there and save the image. Uh, the adjustments are controlled with this slider here. Uh, there's a, a grayscale adjustment. And you can see uh, the histogram moving as I move the grayscale. So if you move your grayscale to, to line up with the steep part of this curve and hit apply, you'll see your image change uh, quite visibly there. And you can also lift up the, the black level a little bit if you wish to as well. Just hit apply. Uh, probably gone too far there. Yeah. Um, so I'll just hit reset and just adjust that again. I don't normally use this to preview. I usually do my levels adjustment once I'm actually in um, Photoshop after I finish with Deep Sky Stacker. So that's Deep Sky Stacker, and uh, we'll, I will close that now and move out to the next step. Thanks for watching, everyone. Hope it was useful. If you liked it, please subscribe.